Six to sixty-eight period with Cream for me, that's that's him at his best. Yeah. I just love that period. It's just really fiery, really tasteful playing. Um, yeah, maybe it's something to do with the fact that he's playing with Jack Bruce and Ginger Ginger Baker. You know, I mean, there's yeah. obviously that was a kind of uh, energy going on there that probably made him play a little bit differently. You're absolutely right. But, uh, people forget how important they were. Yeah, we were the first progressive rock band the first that's ground zero for prog rock yeah. because pop musicians weren't given the opportunity to you know if you listen to fresh cream a lot of it is just improvised blues mm -hmm. and uh, that wasn't that record companies weren't interested in giving musicians that sort of freedom uh, you know their job was to produce hit records that lasted two and a half minutes that's what they were supposed to do so um yeah, the only the only possible uh, predecessor to that is the Frank Zappa's Mothers of Invention freak out. That's probably yeah. again uh, probably the ground zero for prog rock. Even though there was no, they, they didn't really have any players. That's what Eric Clapton was doing. I get a bit frustrated when I see people citing in the Court of the Crimson King as uh, prog's year zero. I think it depends on, you know, everyone's got their own spin on what constitutes prog rock. Yeah. I, the people is talking about Floyd. I don't see them as prog at all. They're more sort of a kind of automatic kind of. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's a different thing altogether. I think Pink Floyd, I don't see them as being prog rock in the same sense of, as King Crimson or, oh. or Yes or Genesis. Um. And Jeff Beck as well, of course, he, he was slightly different because he's more into sort of electronic psychedelic music. He invented psychedelia, Jeff Beck. People forget that. Mm. 1965, those solos he was doing with the Yardbirds. Yeah. On singles. Because the Yardbirds didn't really do an album. It was, you know, that memorable. There's nothing shape-shifting about any of their albums. But the singles, that was a different thing altogether, thanks to Jeff Beck. I think he probably reinvented the, the electric guitar yeah. in 1965 and um, just just invented a whole new language. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. And I'm just such a tasteful player as well, such a great player. Some of the stuff oh, he did yeah. in the 70s I really liked as well, like more fusion-y type of things. Yeah. Where, where we, you know. In the 80s, I, I, 90s, I wasn't that crazy about the sort of records he was making because the, the you know, it's, it's almost as though he's being put into the studio with Dern producers to try and get some kind of crossover. Mm. I don't know, typical kind of 80s synth rock, which yeah. I didn't care. About. And then did the Guitar Shop album, which was, which was brilliant. And then I just heard this um, emotion and commotion, which he did in the early 2000s, which is just stunning. And uh, I you know, didn't really need to do anything for me. That was his defining statement. I think every track on it is just stunning. Recently, I read somewhere that um, you it was like a list. You had had your top 10 lists of guitar solos. And I was quite intrigued of your choices. Um, you had two solos by Frank Zappa, The Inca Roads and Advanced Romance. And what was the other? You had Steve Vai on there, For the Love of God, which I was like, wow, Dave listens to Steve Vai? Wow. <laughs> uh, oh, absolutely. Steve Vai was just um, an amazing, he's just, he was one of the first, well, since post Eddie Van Halen, again, another man who, we wrote rock music. I mean, I think again, actually, record collector in this country, they just published um, Best of 1978. And I, they haven't even listed that album, their list of 
50 non-entities. Uh, there's no mention anywhere of, 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 of Van Halen. And uh, you just said, come on, you're supposed to be a music paper. You must know how important this album is. I can remember hearing it. My brother brought it home. He's still living at home at 78. And uh, he brought it home and, have you heard this? I mean, American heavy metal, I don't think so. Put it on that eruption so <laughs> who's that <laughs> yeah it's pretty remarkable so from then you know that it, it, it inspired the generation of superb musicians was the first person I heard since Eddie Van Halen that to, to actually play in that style and do it really, really well and create some beautiful music. Um, the Love of God, I just remember hearing that. I know you can listen to it now. You can hear all the drop-ins. He's got different guitars going on. It must have taken him weeks to do when, when, the, when the mood kind of drew him in, you know, when he was, when he was moved to do it. You say, no, where did I get this song? Let me just see. But there's some just stunning guitar tracks. So right throughout the 90s, you know, that's when I suddenly started listening to a lot of these American players mm. and, and realising that <laughs> they're making the rest of us look pretty damn silly. <laughs> so, uh, and but the, the, you say, oh, they're just weedly guys, you know. That's a bit, come on, skills, just the, just the brains in these people, the otherworldly. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I know where it comes from. How, how do you apply it? But I suppose it's the same as when, you know, we mentioned Cream earlier. When they came along, previous to that, it was all beat music and Mersey Beach, the Shadows, and bands, uh, you know. The, Bands like the Kinks and the Who, you know, very, very unpolished playing. Though the Shadows were certainly very polished. I don't class them in the same R&B style as, as, as Dave Davis or Pete Townsend. But when Eric Clapton arrived, suddenly those guys started to look tame, you know. They, it's like, oh, this is, this is how it should go. From, this is how we should be playing from now on. So it's the same shift, generational shift in dynamic and skill set. That's, that's really what it is. Yeah. It's a brand new set of skills that uh, I think kids, uh, teens starting to play guitar, be starting from listening to people like, uh, you know, these American metal guys, Marty um, Friedman, uh, it's, it's kind of under the radar in this country, but listen to how they play and the sort of music they're making, it's, it's quite phenomenal. They're able to achieve electric guitar. What I liked about Steve Vai was that he, he, you know, he was a, a real technical player, but he had this musicality as well and this uniqueness to his playing, you know. Um, you know, there was all these other guitar players at the time, these 80s shredders and that. But for me, Steve Vai stood out as being totally unique to them. I guess partly for his, from his Zappa days, you know, that obviously fed into it. And as he said, I, I had a, a, a chat with him a while back and he said that even now some people say, oh, that song that you did on the Inviolate album. He was saying that one of the tracks on the album, somebody said, oh, that sounds like uh, Zappa, you know, but it's it wasn't exactly like Zappa, but it had the spirit of it, you know. How you explain these things is sometimes difficult, you know what I mean, Dave. And um, yeah. but yeah, he was, and that's the thing. You can have both. You can be technically able and also have have nice melodies and nice chords, you know. Um, but yeah, I found it quite interesting that you you would have uh, gravitated to somebody like Steve I and also the Zappa uh solos what can i ask you what is it that you like about those two solos the zappa solos inca Rhodes is still up there for me as one of the great i'm assuming it was improvised basically it's not just frank it's, it's uh, tom fowler the bass player 
what he's doing behind what Frank is doing. It's like a duet. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, the drummer as well, they're all in sync. It's just the perfect trio. Uh, and George Duke, I think, is there playing some, it's, it's just two chords, isn't it? It's just a two chord riff. And, um, but it's melodic, it's got feeling, it's going, so it's taking you on, it's taking you on a little trip. Yes. And it just, it's just what every, you know, if only all guitar players had that sense of it, that thought behind what they're actually doing. Frank's, there's nothing distracting Frank from what he's doing. He's got a bass player, he's got a drummer, and a keyboard player playing some very delicate chords way behind. So Frank is free to just explore his brain taking somewhere. Um, you know, it's not his usual style, which is kind of kind of abrasive and very sometimes very difficult to listen to. No, I agree. Having said that, I mean those those solo guitar albums, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar and Guitar, both of those three album sets it's some magnificent music on those records i i thought do i really need three lps of frank's guitar solos well actually yes i do because it's really good music there's some great music on those records and then again i'll listen to something like his solo on i don't know pojama people and think come on frank you can do better than this. This is this doesn't belong on this record. Just my opinion. No, I, I, I disagree. I, I think in some ways, it's I guess you could say with any solo that's improvised in there, there's always going to be um, moments when you're inspired and moments when you're you're not inspired, and that obviously comes out in the playing. But as you say, if you're putting it on an album, then you'll have a decision as. Uh, you can make the decision as to whether you want it to be on the album or whether you want to do it again or or, or whatever. And and yeah, I, I think even he admitted that not all his guitar solos were were, were, were great, you know, and that's a, a, an interesting admission to, to make um, yeah. as, a, as a musician, you know. You mentioned Advanced Romance. Yeah. Now, what I love about that, that's not Frank, that's uh, Denny Wally, the slide right. player. That's right, yeah. And uh, I... <laughs> Look what she did to Denny right now. <laughs> and off he goes. Yeah. It's just so... I guess you, you're either going to get it or you don't. It's just packed with blues. Every, pretty much that whole track, if you listen to it from start to finish, regardless of guitar solo, it's a whole, it's just a, a, a link of blues cliches. Every part of that song is a, a blues cliche. And, and he really hammers it home, you know, in that style. <laughs> That's what I love about it. It's just so, so. The concept is, is is misery, you know. So, <laughs> it can, and I thought Denny pulled that solo off just about. Actually, I was very fortunate to meet him once. He came to England about ten years ago and did a little tour. Played this tiny pub in uh, in Box, far from real world studios, and uh, I got to see him play with a, with a, a Zappa tribute band from Liverpool. Right. It was called the Muffin. Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a joy to meet him, and we well, claimed he'd seen us play live, and he was a fan. I'm not sure if he did. He was a very nice man, yeah. and I just was glad to have shook his hand. You know, it's funny you mentioned because that album, the, the the track that album's from Bongo Fury, it's it's just a wonderful album as well. I mean, it's just it's it very crazy, but you know, and I guess it's because he's got Captain Beefheart on there, and I I just love that album. It's quite different to a lot of his his other stuff, and. Uh, very, very funny as well. Very so funny. It says, you know. 